So are we saying are we saying that we're not burying any of it now? On sorry. The, the way that the in, in our application, we are not proposing any of it to be buried. Any of it to be buried now. The, the county, you, you know, you, you theoretically can make a decision to cover the county to pay for any section. Uh, the county have to render funds for that. We, so we are, we are, we took all of the distribution under build off. So the distribution is the is the conductors and wire that go out to serve the load, um, to go out to the transformers to serve the, the customer. we we, our board has said, bury that everywhere where it's feasible, and so we've taken that off of you know through that north field section. There's. We're not accommodating those poles for that distribution underbuild. Uh, and I think on the midway side, we're, we're, we've removed the distribution. Um, so there's no distribution lines on, on, the, on these lines. So that is being buried. Um, it's not cheap. Uh, it's going to cost ratepayers you know, a few million dollars to, to get that work done and to you know, be able to uh, bury everything where we've got overhead <coughs> on this on this path right now. Um, you know, we're, we're, the application itself is for the transmission line, right? So I think that here what our board is trying to make some accommodations by removing some of the distribution under the things that can reduce pole heights or reduce the quantity of poles. Uh, it's up to you to determine, you know, which which way it would be better. So who gets to decide the height of the poles? I mean, is it you get the you get the application or the conditional use, and then you guys get to decide <coughs> what we would and what height it gets to be anyway? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So so it, it costs more money to to make the line taller and so there's already incentive to, to not make the line taller than it has to be to meet the code. Um, don't walk through that there's really an, an either or decision that I, I think we're asking this commission to make. Would you prefer more poles that are shorter and, and we can have a shorter rolling status like the distance between poles if it's less distance we can control the, the mid-span wire and, and have shorter poles. Or you could say, I prefer to have, have fewer poles, even if that means the poles are 10 or 15 feet taller. I, I think from our perspective, you know, we would really not go beyond, from span perspective, we wouldn't want to go beyond our, our standards. And so I have to look to my transmission engineer who's out in the hall. But I mean, it, I think at the longest distance, we'd be looking at about 350 feet. And then NESC, the, the safety code that we have to follow, will govern uh, what exactly the poll heights would be. So what, what, what is safer? Or what do you, what's, what's a better approach for either maintenance or safety? Higher and fewer poles with longer stretches or more frequent shorter poles? We would make a design that is that meets all codes in either scenario. Well, that's for what I'm asking. I'm asking what's better. We, we, because if you're asking us to make a decision and whether we need your transmission engineer to comment on it or not, we should get some input so we have a basis to decide. Well, and, I, and I, I'm trying to stick not to aesthetics for a moment. That's important, but just from a safety and engineering perspective, what what's your recommendation? Because you know more about it than I do. Well, in the multiple hours spent with the facilities committee of the Heber Light and Power Board, and you know, showing them the different examples, you know, riding around, looking at stuff, uh, they they really thought that the longer the span can be and the fewer poles is would be their recommendation. Why? Visual, right? Just visual. Okay. Just, just less poles. Yes. Got it. Yeah. I, that, I, that's probably my personal preference as well, but I'm more interested if there's any information from somebody that can say, yeah, we think this is a better approach, or if you don't care. What, which is, I think our recommendation would be the most 
financially efficient possible at some point. <laughs> what you said. Safety and engineering. Don't say anything but safety and engineering. <laughs> I think that they are. Do you have any they can vote be equally. On a safety they, engineering. I, I think essentially they are they are near equal. Here yeah. comes a transmission engineer. Yeah, that's what I want to hear from. What's your name? You got it. Hi, my name is Nicole Kindle. <laughs> nice to meet you. Wait a minute. What was it again? Nicole Kindle. Okay. Yes. Um, transmission engineer for Rocky Mountain Power. Perfect. <laughs> so to answer your question in terms of either shorter poles shorter spans or taller poles, longer spans in terms of a safety requirement. They'll meet all national electric safety code requirements. So safety purposes, it's all the same. Um, fewer poles, less maintenance over time for our crews. So that's a little cheaper in the long run. Less poles, less maintenance, that sort of thing. Shorter poles, you'll have more of them, more maintenance over time, things like that. But in terms of engineering, it's all the same. That is a great answer. Thanks. <laughs> can I ask a question? Did we not ask you to see how short we can make these poles at one point in time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And where are and and where are we on that? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I, I showed this. Now that we're going to have bigger spans and taller I'm, poles. I'm, I'm not suggesting we do this because I, I actually no, think it's difficult. completely ridiculous. But uh, I asked I asked Nicole, and I may drag her back up here. Um, I asked Nicole to draft something up to say, you know, in a hypothetical, how can we drive these these pole heights down? You know. You, Essentially, it's about controlling the conductor at its least controlled spot, so in the mid-span. Right? That's what's closest to the ground. If it's flat ground, closest to the buildings, etc. We have to maintain clearances from that location. So we can do that by getting poles extremely close together. Um, so we are not really proposing this. We produced this really to answer that specific question. Something that could be done that really drives pole heights down to about the size of a distribution pole would result in three individual lines of poles that have to you know, run adjacent to each other. You've got a lot more right of way with, but the pole heights are going to be closer to a distribution pole, you know, around 50 feet, 40 to 50 feet in height. These poles have to be 150 feet apart to maintain clearance from the ground. Uh, and so instead of going from, an example I'll throw out, is a 300 foot rolling stand or a 325 foot rolling stand for a typical overhead transmission line that would have one line of poles, you have three lines of poles with poles every 150 feet uh, to, to try to, and, and, and that's the balancing act, right? right that you're trying to balance. Dan, and this new substation, does that replace the one that's on 6th and less in Eber City? No. Because uh, didn't you have to tie previous, it? Previously proposed was the substation would be right between uh, our natural gas plant at about 750 U.S. area and the event center. So if it was directly in between them right next to uh, Heber City Public Works. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, a location that many stakeholders didn't like us doing that in, and that's why I was requested to go find a different spot. To clarify, I think for Chuck, uh, these wider spans, the minimum size of that pole, the height of that pole would be 95 and that can be 110, is that correct? Yeah, in the in the application as we've submitted it, yeah, that's that's correct for like a typical like quarter pole would be terms, and that and then the tangents would be a little shorter. But obviously, if you if you ask us to go as far as you as far as we, we can, so we went three hundred feet. Well, I think we'd have to go and do the specific math to tell exactly right. what that is. I'm going to pull Nicole up. I'm going to speak incorrectly about that. Nicole, you're on the spot. I think that's the main issue. Would you please repeat the question? I'm sorry. You went 300 feet mm -hmm. for a span. I'll give you approximate total height of the pole. 
So total height on a tangent structure would be around 70 to 75 feet. Um, dead end structures tend to be a little taller <coughs> just because you're turning the corner, so they'd be around 80 feet. So that's a lot different than the 95 and 110 that's been thrown out. We're crossing roads. Um, and originally, the original application that we came in in 2017 had the distribution underbuild on it. That takes up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And so when that is removed, you can significantly reduce the pole height as Heber Light and Powers Board has directed us to do. The one other thing in this application is as we follow the north line back to the bypass corridor, this is uh, just south of the ball fields headed west. That's, we've got a couple spans where we actually have three circuits on, on the line pulled uh, instead of just two. It's for two spans, but that also drives some, a few taller poles. The next to the road, we've got three circuits on the, on the poles. How much taller is that? With the three circuits? Uh, three circuits run around 100. So there'd be a, a limited number of poles. Right, there'll be three of them. And that was to consolidate um, her board recommendation to consolidate on the north line that's right there. So we would use our Rock Mount Powers line, Huber Light and Powers, and both of Huber Light and Powers lines. So you, would, you wouldn't have two lines running adjacent to each other right there. You'd combine them all for two spans, three structures. So if I understand correctly, I'm still here. the distribution certain segments which were getting pretty increased cost to ratepayers. You were reducing the full heights from the north 20 to 30 feet on average? Um, it's about 20 feet, 15 to 20 feet on average. There, there was one say a uh, picture of a picture where it had holes on either side of 113, right in the south field, kind of forming a marquee. Are we getting rid of that? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's that didn't fly, right? and that didn't fly. Oh, and so um, we we moved we moved the line to the west side of Southfield Road, and it kind of cleaned that up <coughs> through there. Um, so over time, this is getting better and better. Hi, uh, yeah, we okay. yeah, we continue to improve. <laughs> <laughs> we wait long enough for it just to see. <laughs> no, it'll get worse. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have more, Mr. Chairman, I have more questions. I do not mean to dominate this meeting, so if anybody can interrupt me. Go ahead. But, some of, but the, a lot of these questions I'm asking because it's anticipating comments that will come from the public, and I'm trying to make the meeting more efficient that way. So, Chuck, did you go ahead? So, if you bury these and the lights go out, or there's a problem with the line, is it easy to find that? What do you do to fix it? I, you know, it's something that's between two balls, I guess. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't have much experience with transmission underground. Uh, not at all, really, but I do have a distribution underground. And, you know, anytime you bury something, you got you, you can't see the problem, and you've got to, you know, try to find the problem with uh, machines and various things like that. The outages can go very long. Uh, and, you know, you know, if there's anybody here from Timberlakes, they know that there's an underground system up there that, you know, we've had nine-hour outages on. Can I just say something? It's in the study that that we received, it talks about some pros and cons of going underground versus really? above ground. Above we're, we're, <coughs> we'll address public comment in when we're done with our issues back right here. But I think I think the comment is there when we talk a lot about the capital that's going to be required for this project if you want to bury it. It seems like maybe nice. additional costs uh, for maintenance. Yes. Is that correct? Can you address that briefly? Uh, yes, that's correct. So, um, underground cable is far more expensive than anything overhead. Um, per your question, so say we had one of the cables go bad from in between a set of bolts. 
you would have to go in and replace that entire cable. You can't just splice it in because the bolt is the splice. So you'd have to pull that whole cable out, pull a whole new one in, and create two new splice pins, two new terminators. So it's not a quick fix. It would take several weeks to several months by the time you got in material to fix this. So it's not a quick, a quick fix or a quick outage in terms of an underground system for transmission. <laughs> If, if you were to have the underground cable on hand, they, they say these splices typically take about an eight or ten hour day per splice. You'd have six. So even if you had it on hand, you'd be pulling all of this cable out, you'd be pulling new stuff in, and you'd have to do all the splices. You're talking about the best case scenario, multiple outages, <coughs> where for an overhead line, it's a matter of hours before power is restored. Um, and then, you know, there are scenarios, and, and quite frankly, it's pretty frequent. If you don't have this exact type of underground conductor on hand, you have to place an order for it. They have to manufacture it, send it to you. It could, it, it could literally be weeks or months before you get it there. And if the county foots the bill for the capital improvements, I'm assuming that the increased maintenance will be distributed to great bears. Is that the plan? Yeah, I, you know, the experts that I've talked to, you know, there's fewer, there's fewer problems with underground because it's buried, you know, there's no trees or anything like that. It's just when you do have a problem, it, it can be very lengthy. Uh, now you're talking about conductor problems, wire problems. That's the big issue. It's yeah. not the normal stuff where, oh, our power went out because overload or some yeah. little raccoon transformer, got raccoon, got it. You're, we're talking about breaks in the wire, yes. flooding. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> but it is less maintenance underground, generally, yeah. because nobody's messing with it. It's very except the underground raccoons. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, you have. Sorry. Thank you. You have. I think it's. I have it as page 5 of 42, so whatever presentation this is, yeah, let's go to page 5. And you told us that there was a facility committee review, they recommended some changes. No, page 5. They, stop that. 5. Other way? Stop. Okay. They've said, you told us that they reviewed it, talked about it, made some recommended changes. Were there any of their recommendations that aren't reflected here? Like, did they say, reroute it? Uh, we, we definitely looked at routes. Because you prepared hard. this, so you're yeah. telling us, this is like, mom said I could stay up late. Yeah, yeah, I, but, absolutely. And, you know, <laughs> and you inform your board members, you sit down with them, and you say, okay, what are we going to do? Right. Um, but there, is there anything else that they recommended that isn't <clears throat> listed here? Uh, you know, I think I've listed everything. Um, that's everything that went, went back to the board of directors. Um, you know, it's long meetings, a lot of talk, uh, and, you know, disagreements within those three members of, of various things. There's a couple of votes taken, um, but this is what went back to the board of directors. Okay. From that, from that three-member committee. Okay, let's go to page six, the next slide. Um, this is the, uh, this tells us that in April 2018, NEI did this cost study that we see elsewhere in this presentation, right? Were you presented or were any other cost studies done on putting this underground? Uh, no, uh, I think not we, that you did. did were any, have any been submitted, or you, has anything been submitted to the planning office? Not that. So no formal studies about other costs. Okay. Um, slide twenty-five and twenty-six. I think it's this. Might be another one. Yeah. So this goes through the county requirements, right? That we go back to our, at least the first time I was on the planning commission and heard this a while ago. And we go through all these elements, they're lettered in the code, but here they're numbered. So it's A through J, I think, in the code, and this is one through 10, probably. 
Um, <coughs> several of these things, I mean, you've answered them the way you need to as an advocate for the project. I'm just not completely sure it's as clear as you think it is. So number one, um, reply, it complies with all requirements of the county code. Well, it does, except the county code also has condition, mitigating conditions. So that's what we're trying to work out. So, so far it doesn't comply, but if we can get all the mitigation sorted out, then it will comply. Number two, business license, I'm sure that can be worked out if it's relevant. Um, number three, I don't know that I can agree with this comment. It's, it's the use is compatible with surrounding structures and use location, scale, mass, design, and circulation. And, and, and you just simply said, well, it doesn't affect it. And it does. I mean, we got power, you, you live here. I mean, we got power poles coming across our valley, which is radical, in my opinion. I'm one guy. That's it, not, it's, you know, big steel poles carrying electricity aren't rural. They're not, in my opinion. I, 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 you could say, go to Wyoming. That's pretty rural. There are all kinds of power poles going across Wyoming. But I don't think that's really the same thing as coming across this valley this way. When, no, when out in Wyoming, sorry for Wyoming people, nobody cares. Because nobody sees it. You know? I mean, that's just my opinion. So I'm not, I'm not sure about this one. Um, number four. Um, I, sorry. I yeah. Ask a question Please. on number three since you're on it. It seems to me that the real question here is this is a conditional use. We all know that 49 foot poles are a uh, permitted use. In my reading of the code, if you want to put 49 foot poles in, you would need them to come before the board. I actually disagree. It's written so that it has to be uh, these 38 kV or below. So we, we pass one test and you go in, but you don't pass the second test. So the voltage is what's making it. Yeah, 38 kV. So if you were doing just 38 kV um, and you know, 49 feet or below, you wouldn't need to come before this body, right? It's my understanding of your work. Okay, and because you're doing um, 138 kV lines, that's. And 46. And 46. So, uh, I mean, but we all know, I think, in Revenue County, is that we could have 49 foot poles there, and whether it carried a particular voltage or not, we may not, may not make a big difference to most of us. But there could be a 49 foot pole there. Here you're proposing between 70 and 85, it sounds like, and maybe a few hundred foot poles. Um, did you ever look at, do you, is there any evidence, do you have anything pointing to whether number three that we're looking at here would be impacted by a difference between 50 foot and 70 or 85 foot or 100 foot. See what I'm saying? The question is, you could put a 49 foot pole in that same location. Is there any evidence? So what's the delta in impact exactly. from, going from a 49 foot pole to a, but I, I don't know that we have empirical data. I, maybe, you know, you, as, as uh, Commissioner Hendricks mentioned, he's got an opinion about Wyoming and an opinion about transmission lines through here. I mean, I, I don't know that we're going to necessarily come, come to terms. Oftentimes, these conditional uh, use permit standards are written up with a, a Lowe's or a Home Depot in mind. It's not necessarily a transmission line. So, you know, the, if you're looking at a structure, it's saying, does the structure fit in with surrounding structures and location scale, traffic flows, etc. You know, you, you, we look at this and say, is it something that really you know, applies from a question perspective? Our line does not affect our neighbors in the scale, mass, traffic flow of their facilities. And I Here, guess that's how we. Here, here's the point, and this is an important, really, I think, a really important one. Because if we vote to, to support this, there will be people who will hate us and say the commission blew it, the commission, and the point that Commissioner Jukes is making is a really important one for everyone to understand. There's a point at which you can say, fine, we'll just do it this way. We're gonna put four 49-foot poles, we're gonna do it because the growth requires it. I, I completely buy the fact that we are under 
tremendous growth pressure, and then with it comes infrastructure requirements. So, but the point, I think, I don't mean to speak for you, but it's really important. There's going to be something is going to be done. And what we're really trying to do is say, well, if this is the, if it's going to be 49 foot poles, 48 foot poles, and lots of them, or a single 80 foot or occasional 100 foot pole, something's going to happen here. And it's either going to be above ground or underground, and either we've chosen the right route or we haven't chosen the right route. So I, it's a really important point to understand. There's a point at which something's going to be done anyway, and we just have to decide and try to make it the best possible thing. And so I guess the, the question for me is not whether a power pole will be incompatible with um, surrounding structures and use location, scale, mass design, circulation. The question is whether a 75-foot power, power pole as opposed to a 49-foot power pole would make a difference in this circumstance, because that's really all we're discussing. Um, and I just wonder if there's any evidence in the record that helps us make that determination. Yeah. If we go to the 49 foot poles, isn't that the three across and the big, and the big right uh, easements and all that stuff? I think that's one point that is. Uh, that yeah, if you're going to try to meet the intent of what the power code is written, um, I, I don't know that I'll let Cole speak, but I don't know if there's anything you know that is empirical that can be shared. But I think it'd be hard for somebody to argue that twice as many poles that take a a lot more right of way would not be more impactful than a single line of poles that these facilities are shared with both utilities. Well, for example, you don't have an appraisal that could tell us that a hundred foot pole would uh, damage further property values as opposed to a 50 foot pole, for example. No, I don't, I'm just, I'm just Trying to get the ducks in a row with evidence we really don't have. And it sounds like Ms. Kendall has something to say. She's very smart. <coughs> Always. Um, so I, um, to look at this and to kind of go with the spirit of your code of anything under 49 feet, I took the section from the map up here from basically structure 283 to structure 295, if you can see it. Um, and did the 40, under 49 foot poles with the three of them. So it takes 81 poles to get from structure 283 to structure 295 in that section of line with 49-foot 